right, now, these slides are just going to go and go and go and go. So um, I'll keep an eye on the time. I know people need to get trains and stuff. I will try and finish by 25 past. Um, if you think I'm getting, just, you know, wave me down. All right. So express terms. So contract disputes ultimately, in most cases, I know pretty much everyone we've read so far has been a contract dispute about whether a contract even exists or not. But for the most part, contract disputes are about what the contract means. So the first part of having a dispute about what the contract means is actually working out what's in the contract. So what terms are in and what terms are out. So we're talking here about terms in a sense of promissory terms. So they're terms, things that were said, things that were written down, things that were communicated that were intended to be binding, binding or intended to be relied on. In fact, they part, form part of the promise. And we need to distinguish those from things that were said, things that were written down, things that were communicated that weren't promissory in nature, that show things like puffs, we've spoken about before, um, opinions perhaps, um, estimates maybe, really depends on the circumstances. Um, so again, I'm going to fly through the slides this time because there's a lot there and there's a lot for you to have a look at. So, puffs. Puffs were a big part of the conversation or the dispute in Carlil and Catholic Smoke Ball. When you think about that case, a big part of what was actually being disputed there was, was the promise that was made to pay an amount of money to somebody who got the flu an enforceable promise? Was it a representation that was promissory in nature? And at the time, the smoke ball company argued, no, it, one of the arguments was, we never meant it. We had no intention from the very beginning of keeping that promise. It's from that argument that we get a clear statement. It doesn't matter what you meant on the inside. It matters what it looked like you meant on the outside. Um, but another of the arguments was, well, nobody could seriously have believed it. It was a puff. And that's one of the reasons why I point out to you that it was a promise that was effectively to pay in the order of 300,000 Aussie dollars, I think. I can't remember. No, it was more than that. It's about half a million dollars, isn't it? Um, so you think about, um, I always think about the cold, cold and flu ads. Probably shouldn't use the names of... Uh, products, but I will. They used to have a little jingle, soldier on, soldier on. You can take these cold and flu tablets and you can still perform your job adequately. Now, it will not surprise you to know that I have not taken a cold and flu, cold and flu tablet today, just in case I pass out in the classroom. I'm pretty sure I'm at best doing my job adequately today. Um, but if their ad was, you can do your job adequately if you take these cold and flu tablets, and if you can't, so in fact it's survey time, you guys are now at liberty to do those good teaching, what do they call, we call them the good teaching scores, um, and you call them the course experience survey, you can do the course experience survey, you can give me absolutely the worst scores ever because I am completely sucking with this cold. Let's limit it to the cold. It'll hurt my feelings if you talk about the other reasons that I suck. And um, so I've got this evidence then that I couldn't do my job adequately when I had the cold, so I could show up and get half a million dollars. Whew, that sounds pretty good. Would that be a puff? So in Carlyle and Carbolic Smoke Ball, because of the way it was presented, it wasn't. This particular advertisement that we have here, we all know that if you drink that stuff, you can't fly. We know. Well, sometimes when you mix it with other things, you think you can fly, but let's, we're just talking about straight from the vending machine, all right? So when we have a puff, a puff has no legal effect. So a representation has been made but it is not promissory and it is not expected to be promissory. So, let's talk about the difference, this term representation and the difference, well, 
I was about to say the difference between terms and representations, but all terms are representations, but not all representations end up being terms of the contract. So we need to explore when a representation is simply that, something that is communicated between the parties before the contract's entered into, and when does it become a part of the contract that is created. So we need to think about it in a range of different ways because representations are made in all sorts of ways. People will talk about the facts, how, what capacity a product has, um, whether or not it complies with certain standards or with the law, or um, they will talk about the weather when they're having negotiations. Um, some statements are made, representations are made to induce a contract. Some, but not all, are intended to be relied upon. And not all statements that are made to induce a contract are intended to be relied upon. So a puff is a good example of that. It's made to have, uh, you know, a, puffing, a puffery statement is made often to make people laugh, to make people aware of the product, but there's no promise made. Another example I like to use there is that deodorant that brings millions of people to your room when you spray it. And the mothers of every 14-year-old boy in the country understand how, even though they get that that's not going to happen, they're still going to spray that disgusting stuff all the way through the house. Don't laugh, you've done it. Um, some representations, if they're false, there may well be remedies available under the trade... Oh, God, I really am regressing. Under the Competition and Consumer Act, um, thou shalt not in trade or commerce say stuff that is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. So it might be prohibited conduct anyway. It might end up having some... Uh, damages connected to it, but it mo it's not necessarily connected as a term. So we need to be able to recognise them and then we need to work out which representations are terms. So terms are the statements that the parties agree on. They need to have a promissory nature, they need to be intended to be binding, they define the rights and the obligations of the parties and if they're breached once a contract is made, then there are contractual rights that arise from that. Depending on the type of term, that could be rescission or termination of the contract, or in some case, or it might just be damages, it might lead to the ability to seek an injunction or to get an order of specific performance. Injunction and specific performance are both equitable remedies. So, let's dive in a little bit deeper into categorising the terms that we find in contracts. Can you see I've reorganised my slide pack so I can do the videos? Nice little chunky bits. Um, I just haven't done the videos. So terms of contracts, we talked about this last week when we were talking, uh, oh no, the week before when we were talking about certainty. Um, another classification model is by looking at the type of term. So we have conditions. Conditions are essential terms. These are the more important contractual terms. In fact, if there is an essential term that is missing, a contract may not even exist because it will fail, formation will fail for a lack of certainty. So certainty in the sense of completeness. So certainty requires a contract to be, have all of the essential terms addressed in some way. We also have warranties the relatively less important terms. And I alluded to it when we talked about, um, ab about uh, certainty. There's this intermediate class of term. They're called intermediate terms. Sometimes they're referred to as anonymous terms. Um, anonymous is just a word I'm going to really struggle with today. And these are the terms that are not, don't easily fall into either category. Um, and effectively what happens with these terms, actually I've got, a, I've got a slide that explains them in a minute, I'll get to them in a second. So let's focus on the essential terms first. Tramways, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago and this is taken straight from the case. 
test of essentiality, so the test as to whether a term is essential or not, appears from the general nature of the contract when we take it as a whole, or from a particular term or terms that show us that the promise is of such importance to the promisee that he or she wouldn't have entered into the contract unless they had been assured of a strict or substantial performance of that promise, as the case may be, and this ought to have been apparent. So sometimes in the written document it can be as simple as clauses four, five and six are essential terms. And because this is an agreement that's going to be read if it all comes to custard by a court, a court understands what essential term means. So again, I think I've recommended this a couple of times in different research contexts. Often looking at the terms and how they're used in a legal dictionary will help you with getting that precision. Um, and another good research tool for these things can be uh, words and phrases judicially considered. So before you put something in a contract, as you think about what the words are, you might find that you go and have a look and see if those words have been judicially considered. Has a judge already decided what best endeavours means or reasonable endeavours means and compared the two before you say you need to use all reasonable endeavours to put my ad on the side of a tram for not less than eight hours a day. Okay? Um, intermediate, anonymate terms. Uh, UK concept came from a Hong Kong fur case back in 1962. Since 2007, there has been no doubt that the High Court accepts this classification of terms as a consequence of the Kung Fu Tu and Sandpine case. Um, effectively, what happens when you have an intermediate term is... Oh, actually, I'll show you the table that I put together. If you've got a breach of a condition, then regardless of the consequences, the person who is offended by the breach, who suffers the breach, can require the, the contract to be terminated, even if their actual damage is quite minor. If you breach a warranty, the other side can seek damages but cannot terminate the, co uh, ca um, terminate the contract even if the damage to them is really substantial. So for those two, we don't look at what the nature of the damage is, the impact of the clause is, only the classification of the clause. It's when we have an intermediate term that we look at the nature of the damage. If it's an intermediate term and the damage is only minor, then a, or the consequences are only minor, then the per, party who is affected by that, the other party's breach, can't terminate the contract. They can only seek damages. But if the consequences for them are significant, then they can opt to terminate. So consequences make a difference. Understood? So that's where this kind of working out what type of clause it is, cases that deal with that are largely going to what kind of damages or what kind of action that the person who has suffered the breach can take. So, how do we work out whether a representation is a term? As I said before, all, all terms are representations of some sort, but not all representations are terms. Actually, I'm going to revise my Venn diagram in my head because some terms might be implied by law, custom or... F terms that are implied by fact are likely to be representations to a point, but implied terms won't always be representations. Okay? But express terms, all express terms will be re representations, not all... Sorry, all... Yeah, all expressed terms will be representations, but not all representations will be terms. Did I make any sense to you then? No. Um, who has the whiteboard marker in their bag? Oh, you are a star. <laughs> this is, oh, actually, maybe I can do it here. I'll see. I've just, you've just reminded me that I can draw on my screen. This will be easier for 
those of us who are playing at home. Let me return to this, do that, do this. And I need a pen. I think I need the pen to be white. There we go. So, representations. These are things that people say, do or communicate. Then we have terms, express terms. All of them sit inside, OK? Express terms are always going to be representations. But things like puffs, um, potentially opinions, you're going to need to decide on the facts, whether that's a term or whether it's just a representation. OK, so all express terms, they come from representations. They come from communications that one party has made to another party. But not all representations will are promises. So not all of them will become terms. Or even if they are promises, they might not be promises intended to be binding. Is that a little bit better? Cool. Now I'm sitting down. There's a really good chance I won't stand up. OK. So, relevant factors, high level. They include things like, well, what's the language that is used? We'll talk about JJ Savage and Oscar Chess and Williams in a minute. We will also, again, um, JJ Savage, Oscar Chess and Dick Bentley are all cases that go to the relative expertise of the parties. Um, so, in understanding who is the party who has knowledge here, um, where is there the opportunity for what the economist would call a moral hazard? So if my doctor tells me stuff about how a medicine would work, that might be a contractual promise as to how it's going to work, maybe not. Um, whereas if my mother tells me how a medicine is going to work, it might be a complete, my mother is not a doctor nor is she entirely sane when it comes to medications. Relative expertise. How important is the term? Is it something which a party made their decision to buy or to sell or to enter into the contract on? So we'll talk about Van den Eschert if we get there, otherwise the beginning of next week. Um, Van den Eschert is also relevant to timing. Um, the form of a written agreement. Do we have something in writing? Um, is it consistent or inconsistent with the promises that have been made? We probably won't get to that this week. We'll do that next week and we'll talk about that in the context of the parole evidence rule. And then, oops, sorry, I thought I had another bubble. Um, we have this lovely all other relevant circumstances. So again, where this hopefully is leading you to the idea that the courts will use an objective test. There are some formulas that it's created from these examples, but it will use an objective test to determine whether or not a, a statement, a communication that was made is promissory in nature. Again, why do we care? We love to categorise things as lawyers. It's useful, particularly in exam, uh, to be able to demonstrate that you know what categories things fit into. But the categories are really there to help you think about them. So again, in an assignment, I am probably less interested in your ability to categorise things per se than I am in your in ability to make sense of things once you put them into the categories. So uh, it's interesting. Um, it's affected online people more than face-to-face uh, -face people this week. This morning, I marked the uh, outstanding discussion board tasks. And the most, not the most recent task, and it might have been the most recent task, one of the two, because I had to mark two lots in one day, uh, the problem that related to Judy and Carl and some unsatisfactory accommodation in Queensland. Um, pretty much everybody who did it in the OUA group, um, I'm not outing any of you, I hope, um, 
they looked at it immediately and they did some categorization, which said, okay, Carl is under the age of 18, so he's a minor, so I've categorized this as a problem about capacity. Where the question actually pointed out that Judy had entered into the contract for her son, Carl, and then Carl found the, satis uh, uh, the um, uh, accommodation unsatisfactory, you were asked, can he sue? It was actually a privity question. Um, so again, it, it wasn't a stupid thing by any, you know, it, they were put together very much because those two topics were done in the same, um, in the same weeks. Uh, and definitely the approach that you, the good students took was to deal with the bigger problem first. Well, no, he can't sue, but his mother has entered into the contract. I think she was his mother, I can't remember the facts now. All he has to do is go back and say to her just the same as if he had done something to breach the contract, the landlord would have had to go back to Judy first, but then deal with the, um, the capacity issue. Now again, it's a pretty simple example, but it's by using the categorization, what kind of problem is this? Which of the, which of the relevant features might exist here? Um, and not necessarily starting at the first one, but identifying all of the potential categories, then weighting which is the best way to approach this. People came out with stronger or weaker answers. Um, not, you know, not that they were terrible, but there we are. Um, what else am I going to say here? Um, it's also important to remember, and we'll deal a lot more with this in week 11, that false representations, even when they're not contract terms, might give rise to other rights, uh, particularly under um, the Fair Trade Act in the States or the Competition and Consumer Act um, generally. Very fancy animation there. I must have been having an animation day. Anybody else do that? I procrastinate animate. I could procrastinate slide create, I think, when I don't want to do something hard. I just go back and make my slides pretty. It's like, it's sad. I really, I need, I need an intervention. They're not even that pretty. But, you know, there you go. Um, we need to look at the language, clearly. The kind of language that is used gives us some clues acting objectively uh, as to what was meant by the statements made. So things that say, I promise you that I will. I warrant that this will happen. We will guarantee blah, blah, blah. Those things are inherently promissory in nature. But things like, I would think that, or potentially, I would estimate, um, it could be anywhere between A and B up to, you know, with an up to 10% chain, whatever. It's like, think about the language that's used. Let me give you some examples of this. Um, opinions. Opinions, any of you who end up doing M&A with me over summer, we will probably spend a bit of time talking about opinions at one point because Often when gentlemen are looking for money from other gentlemen, they get a third party gentleman to come in and give evaluation or audit the numbers or otherwise give their opinion about whether or not it's a good or a bad risk. Um, so particularly in, so from my experience where I see most of the issues that arise in relation to opinions is the fight that you will have uh, as a company who's going and spending a large amount of money on an independent expert, a lawyer, a geologist, an accountant, an auditor, um, a technology person, who's going to give you an opinion about uh, whether or not you're going to win a case, whether or not the minerals in the ground that you want to explore have any value, whether or not your technology has got any, is any good or whether it breaches somebody else's IP, any of those things. And you want to bank that. You want to be able to rely on that when you go and ask strangers for money because if it turns out they're wrong, the strangers lose their money, the strangers will sue you or worse. 
So often the fight on the early stage of the opinions is at what's, how much of this are we going to be able to bank. So let me give you an example of uh, where opinions come up. Um, anybody know where this is? No locals? OK. Williamstown, yeah. Well, it's like, I, um, I'm seriously the daggiest person ever. It's a few years ago, I took that photo when I was taking my son for one of the 120 hours of supervised driving that we have to do. And so I made him take me to different places where cases have been. So, and then, and then we'd either take the photos or he'd get grumpy and I couldn't do it. So this is JJ Savage at uh, Williamstown. So JJ Savage is a case about a speedboat, of course it is. And so Mr Blakeney, he wanted to um, buy a speedboat and so he asked JJ Savage and Sons for some uh, information about uh, the different options that he had. In fact, JJ Savage put it in writing. They gave a really detailed account of the different capacities of three different types of engines ultimately coming up with a recommendation um, and saying how fast this particular engine would go because he wanted to be able to go 15 miles an hour or faster. Of course he did. Um, so he liked that one better. He'd actually compared a few other quotes, signed the contract, bought a boat, wasn't very happy. Turns out the boat was really, really much slower than his 15 miles an hour. What did the court say? Sorry, an estimate as to the speed that it'll go is not the same as a contractual term. Yes, he had some expertise, but he was looking at a number of different factors. He gave an estimate. The estimate was given in good faith. Ultimately, you made a choice. Um, it was particularly uh, difficult for Mr Blakely that none of the other so-called experts were prepared to um, give an opinion that it would go at the speed that he wanted. Um, this is a decision of the full court, so um, very or beyond persuasive, this is the law. So far as being a promissory expression, estimated speed 15 miles an hour, indicates an expression of opinion as the result of approximate calculation based on probability. To use the dictionary equivalent of estimate, it is not a contractual term. It's an interesting judgment because it shows us that the court will go and see what ordinary people in ordinary circumstance would expect the language that was used to mean. So let's continue on with that theme where we've got people who've got expertise, who share opinions, but we have differences in their relative expertise. So the first case here is Oscar Chess. So um, Mr Williams took his mother's, I think it's a Morris Minor. Sorry, see if I can see in my notes. Anyway, little old car, only driven by a little... Yeah, it was a Morris Minor. Uh, only driven by a little old lady. She was the fifth owner. She bought it from somebody else. Uh, it had a um, log book in the glove box that said it was a 1948 model. And so he took his mother's Morris Minor in to the car dealer and sold it to them. Um, six months later, they said, hang on a minute, We've just done a proper check and it turns out actually it's a 1938 model. It's 10 years older than you told us it was. Um, you've breached the contract. That was an essential term that you described the goods properly. You need to take your car that we can't sell back. Uh, sorry, actually. So here we've got an individual who, uh, who actually wasn't even the owner of the car. It's his mother's car. And then we've got a car dealer. It's actually impossible. I think you would notice these days if a car was 10 years older than somebody purported it to be, it would look different. That's one of the things that amuses me about this case. So this is a decision from Justice Denning. You'll find it in your case book. Much depends on the precise words, he says. 
that were used. If the seller says, I believe it's a 1948 Morris, here's the registration book to prove it, there's, no clear, there's clearly no warranty. It would be a statement of belief, not a contractual promise. But if the seller says, I guarantee that it's a 1948 Morris, this is borne out by the registration book, but you need not rely solely on that. I give you my own guarantee that it is. It's definitely a 1948 model. Then the seller is making himself contractually responsible, even though the registration book is wrong. I ask myself, what is the proper inference from the known facts? So in other words, he's using an objective test. It must have been obvious to both that the seller himself had no personal knowledge of the year when the car was made. So it goes on to say, in these circumstances, the intelligent bystander would, I suggest, say that the seller did not intend to bind himself so as to warrant that it was a 1948 model. If the seller was asked to pledge himself to it, he would at once have said, I can't do that. I've only got the logbook to go by the same as you. Okay, so the relative expertise, we've got the car dealer is in a position to know better, most likely. So let's look at Dick Bentley. So Mr Bentley, clearly a man who took his name seriously, was very keen on getting himself a Bentley car. He specifically wanted one that had been well vetted and he was advised to and did go to, sorry, what are they called? Harold Smith Motors, because Harold Smith Motors, they were the experts in relation to Bentley. 1965, beautiful year. So they found that this car, they said it was a car of his dreams. It had a replacement engine and gearbox in it, but it had only done 20,000 miles. It's just the perfect car for you. So he bought the car, but, Turns out it had done way more than 20,000 uh, miles. It was bad, uh, it, 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 the gearbox and the motor didn't work. It drove like a dog. That's possibly not a direct quote from the case. <laughs> There's a little idiom, little idiom for you. Um, so they found very similar facts. Somebody has sold a car to somebody else turned out to be not what they expected, but they distinguished Oscar Chess. Why? Because Harold Smith Motors were the expert. They were the ones who should have known whether or not it was a good car. And specifically, Dick Bentley went to them looking for advice and held himself out as having no expertise. Sarisha, you look very distressed about this result. Does that not make sense to you at all? Or do you just no, want a Bentley? Ah, uh, now good point. I'm waiting because comparing it to the boat case. So how is this different from the boat case? So in JJ Savage, they were presumably the experts. He went to them and said, give me the different options, recommend what's best. Shouldn't the result be the same as this? Or shouldn't the result in that be the same as JJ Savage? It was a suggestion. It was, it, they used the word estimate. Okay, so look at the language that was used. The principles are the same. We're still using an objective test. JJ Savage is a little bit problematic, um, I will say. And I think that if the Trade Practices Act had been in place at the time that that case was heard that we would probably have seen a different action brought and a different result. So, yeah, yeah. Oscar Chess is distinguishable. Some good law here. For the, if a representation is made in the course of contractual negotiations for a contract for the purpose of inducing the other person to act on it and that actually does induce them to go into the contract, then that's prima facie grounds for inferring that the representation was intended as a promise or as a warranty. Of course, it's rebuttable, but that's the point where we're at. OK, I'm going to try and do one, maybe two more, and we'll see where we get. So, ah, oh, other part of factors, importance, timings, etc. So, 
how important a statement is will impact the extent to which a court is likely to find it to be a uh, representation to be a term or not, particularly if it induces somebody to enter into the contract. The quote on the screen there is from Van and Eschett and Chapel. Um, Van and Eschett and Chapel is, I, I find this an amusing case, 1960. Um, contracting parties, it's about the sale of a house. The vendor and the purchaser are around the kitchen table. Uh, look, I make up facts, might not be, could be anywhere. But they were about to sign the contract. So our purchaser is literally holding the pen, about to sign the contract. Again, I make up the facts, but it was very, very close to that point in time. Uh, and he says, oh, hang on a minute, didn't do a pest inspection. Are there any white ants? And the vendor says, no, 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 no. If there'd been any, I would have taken steps to eradicate them. And we're right there where he's got the pen and he's about to sign the contract. So he signs the contract, the house is sold, turns out, place is riddled with white ants and substantial damage. Little procrastinator animation there, just for you. Um, so, question, is that promise that was made or is that statement, if there'd been any, I would have taken steps to eradicate them, is it a term of the contract that there are no white ants? Yes. Ready? Bit of a yes? Okay, we've got a couple of our conveyancing people here. It's like, it's not in writing, okay? So we've got a bit of an issue here. It's not in writing because we've got that parole, uh, we, sorry, we've got the formalities issues that we were talking about the other day. And since Adam was a boy, um, the responsibility for checking out whether or not the property is suitable for purpose, it's buyer beware. It's the purchaser who does the pest inspection. Uh, so it would be quite unusual for a vendor to make a promise that there are no white ants. Yeah, I'm just falling with you. You guys were right to start off with. Yes, it was a term of the contract. Um, the reason for that was the importance of the statement and the timing. Now, under the parole evidence rule, there were no statements that were inconsistent with that promise. Um, and ultimately, the lack of writing, um, we've got an equitable, uh, equitable remedy that allows us to get around in relation to that. But the timing of the statement, now if the statement had been made three weeks before, it's very unlikely that it would be a term because there would be ample time. But when you're sitting there, the deal is done, everything's agreed, and the, vendor, the purchaser is about to sign the contract and then says, oh, oh, hang on a minute, I've got one more thing. And the vendor says, I don't know, that's all right. That statement is made to induce the contract, it's to induce the signing of the contract. So he was held to it. Very, very rare these days for the vendor and the purchaser to be in the same room when a contract is signed. Real estate, you're a real estate agent, aren't you? How, when did you last have the vendor and the purchaser in the room at the same time? Um, not, not that but frequently, not that frequently. Yeah, this case, I suspect, is one of those reasons. Because people say silly things. Um, yeah, don't think there's anything else there I want to say. Yeah, Craig. If your friend is running and say, I'm buying this house, I'm worried that there are white ants, the vendor says there are not, I want to sign the contract, what do you suggest I do? What would your suggestion uh, be? Sorry, can you, I can't hear, okay, there, you're there and somebody rings? Yeah, Kath, you're the contract expert. I would be, okay, I'm, I'm not happy to be in litigation, I don't want to find it out in front of a court, right? Get them to write it down, add it to the special conditions. Let's write the words down in the special conditions. Um, I guarantee that there are no white ants and I will cover the costs of any um, eradication or damage if there are. Question, why did you add the part of I will cover the costs? Is it 
Oh, just again, it's a good question. Partly habit. Um, but the thing is, the clearer that you are, then we don't have to have a fight about it. Because I can make you a promise. I can make you a promise that I'm going to teach you all sorts of golden goodness in this course. And, but if I don't, unless I've also made you a promise that I'm going to compensate you for, I don't know, the headache pills you had to take from getting over being in a room with me for two hours every week, um, what's the good to you? So again, that's, and that's like years of training as much as anything too. It's like particularly when you're writing, if you're writing seeking warranties from the other side, then you want to seek matching indemnities so that if you, if it turns out any of those warranties are incorrect, any of the promises that they make about the thing that they're selling, we want you to cover that cost. Because that's what contracts are. They're ultimately about the allocation of risk. And risk in commercial sense is just about who's going to put their hand in their pocket. So if I'm the one, if I'm the one who's best placed to guarantee that you'll get a quality education, then it's easier for me to take on that risk. I'm not guaranteeing that, by the way. I just could be making this stuff up. Again, that's another thing we learn is we don't overpromise. <laughs> Make sense? Yeah, so the question is by you saying you'll cover the cost, could you be, I guess, in the case that there is, be putting yourself in a worse off position by, I guess, suggesting the remedy? Does that make sense at all? No, it does, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> sorry about that. Um, It does, uh, uh, yeah, look, at the end of the day, on those 11th hour things, covering the cost, um, it, it might be that you decide, you could say this is an essential term. It's an essential term of the contract and you can, and you can work out. It's unlikely that anybody's going to agree it's an essential term at the 11th hour though. And the thing is, I, I don't, there's no reason to think that the guy who says, no, I haven't got white, white ants. If I'd seen one, I would have done something about it. He's He's not necessarily being dishonest. He wants to sell his house, but he's not necessarily being dishonest. It's so the thing about white ants, you don't see them. That's why you get a pest inspector to come in and have a look, right? So, you know, he may well have thought that he was in the best position to know he's lived in the house for however long. He knows what its condition is. What we think is not always true. People rarely enter into contracts setting out to breach them. Like, so they make promises, but you can't always keep them. So, Harry, are you trying to make, ask a so, question too? No, I've been in fast school, but like, if you were the purchaser and you were a conveyor for insects or a pesticide expert, mm. and you took the advice of the vendor at face value, would the court potentially find it different? In, in yeah, I think they would. I think it's a really good example. If that was your... If that was your gig, oops, yeah. sorry, you're a pest inspector, you've come and done two or three looks at the house, you've got a sneaky suspicion. Um, yeah, because, again, we're using an objective test. Who's in the best position to know? Again, it would come down to the evidence. But, again, going back to why I answered Craig's question the way I did is, I'm a transactional lawyer. I don't want to fight for the sake of having one because as soon as... Nobody goes to court unless they think they can win, right? So the other side thinks they can win too. Or they've got a really crap lawyer <laughs> who's actually not... Um, because that's one of our duties as solicitors is to advise our client uh, as to their best interests. And we also have a duty that's even higher than that to the court. So we can't waste the court's time. So if we think we're running on a loser, we've got to advise our client that it's a loser. Um, so ultimately, everybody thinks they've got a good chance of winning when they hit the steps. I, I want to avoid, I, I want to avoid going to court at all, where I can. Um, 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 um. Other relevant circumstances, this is our kind of catch-all. Um, judges, nothing here is necessarily decisive. So those are examples, um, but I think actually, Harry's really helped us close it off nicely. Um, because we're going to need to look at the facts objectively each time. Um, judges often disagree, disagree amongst themselves as to what's promissory and what isn't. 
Um, an assessment needs to be made on the facts of each case as to whether a statement would reasonably be considered a contractual promise by a person placed in the situation that the parties are in. So have a look at your textbook on the points. Um, here is a checklist I created earlier for you. Um, towards the end, one of the things that I often recommend people do is go through and find the slides that have summaries on them. Um, I think this is a particularly nice one. Just thought I'd point it out to you. So we're going to finish up there for today um, because I think that is a nice, good place for us to stop. We will continue on. I will probably start making some desk lectures, but I am going to work things through on the basis that you did not have the benefit of a week nine uh, desk lecture when I'm presenting next week. Um, because it's unfair if you don't have it for me to assume that you've been able to look at it. Okay, but there are desk lectures for next week. Okay, have a great time, people. Hopefully I'll be a lot healthier next week, and hopefully you'll be healthy too.